God bless you guys. Uh, I'm thankful to God for another uh, Sunday. Thankful for uh, for all you guys being with us. And um, we are really just right in the middle of a series. And um, what we're looking at is a uh, new wine, right? We're looking at new wine. That's been the title of our series. And God has really given us so much each week. Uh, last week, we talked about something that we're going to go ahead and continue with. And um, I'm going to uh, quote our main scripture, which is John chapter 14. I'm going to go ahead and quote that scripture. And then uh, from there, we can go ahead and um, move into our next scripture. John chapter, uh, we'll start at John 2 uh, for the first scripture. But John chapter 14, we know that we're, we're in this series. It says, uh, let us not, let not our hearts be troubled. Believe God, believe also in me. Believe God, believe also in me. That's where we've been. Jesus has been uh, telling them uh, that they are in a position whether that, that they can allow for their hearts to be troubled or not to be troubled, right? Believe in God, believe also in me is what he told them. And so we can see, right, as we begin our year in 2021, that, that we really have the, uh, the potential, the, uh, the ability to control whether or not our emotions go left, our emotions go right. Right. We can't keep the situations from coming. Jesus said that in this world we would have trouble, but not to let our hearts remain troubled. Don't let it stay with you. Don't let it uh, derail and deflect you uh, from what God has from you. Know that he is with you. Jesus said, believe in God, believe also in me. Right. Let not your heart be in trouble. So what keeps our heart from being in trouble is what we believe. We've been in this series. We've talked about it for so long. So it comes down to the belief system. I believe that when Jesus showed up, one of the things he truly wanted to do was impact our belief system. He wanted to impact our belief system because what we believe truly truly uh, determines what we see in life, what we, what we manifest in life, what, what, what God is able to truly accomplish. He went into a place and, and he said he was not able to do what he came to do because of all of their unbelief. God wants to shift our belief. He wants us to believe in him, to expect him to show up, to expect him to be there, to expect him to do what only he can do. And so in our series, A New Wine, we started off in John chapter 2, and we're going to take you over there. Verse 1, it says, On the third day there was a wedding in the Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Okay, I want you to catch this. There was a wedding, and guess what? Jesus was there. There was a wedding, and Jesus was there. That is the turning point in the story. Right here, they're already establishing that there's a wedding and what? Jesus is there. Watch this. When the wine ran out, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. I want you to catch this. They're at a wedding and Jesus is there. And what happens? Houston, we have a problem. Wherever Jesus is, you really don't have a problem. That's the point of this whole thing. Wherever Jesus is, you truly do not have a problem. You guys know last week we talked about how, how the disciples of the Pharisees and the disciples of John, they come to Jesus and they want to know why is it that your disciples are, 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 are always uh, that, that our disciples are always fasting, but your disciples are eating and drinking. They could not understand. Look, we're over here. We're fasting. We're praying. We're mourning. We're sad. We're, 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 we're in sackcloth and ashes and all types of different things. And they say, your disciples, though, you guys look like you guys are having a ball. You guys are out here doing other things that we're not used to. And Jesus makes a statement. He says, how? How can my disciples fast when the bridegroom is with them? How can they fast when the bridegroom is with them? My question to you, is Jesus at your wedding? Is Jesus at your house? Is Jesus at your, at your, at your situation, at your problem? Because if he's there, how can you mourn? How can you be sad? How can you stay in this place of defeat? Because Jesus is ready to shift the situation. All we got to do is ask. 
the mother, uh, the mother of Jesus, Mary, goes up to Jesus and presents to him the problem. See, sometimes we're in a place where we don't present God the problem. We, got, we say, God, I got it. God, I'm going to go ahead and handle this. I'll holler at you later. Uh, we've all been there where we're not in this place where we turn to God first. I love how Mary, she must have seen this demonstrated in her house because why else? Would she go to Jesus with the problem? See, she's the only one that has had Jesus around her the whole time. See, the Bible says that miracles have not been uh, recorded, and all the things that that we uh, that 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 Jesus actually accomplished was not uh, written in the scriptures. Mary had an experience with her son that knew that he was the one that could fix the situation uh, when it was the time. And so Jesus is here with us and I'm asking you, what experiences have you had with Jesus? Because if you look back over your life, one of the things that me and Yvonne, um, we really work hard at is because it hits us, trouble hits us, situations hit us just like they hit you. And, but, but we're learning to look back and be like, you know what, this is familiar. I've been in this kind of situation. I've been in this place of, of fear and concern, but man, God did it last time. God did it last time. He was right there. He will do it again. He's not changing. He's a present help in the time of need. See, the presence of Jesus at this wedding made the difference. There was probably wine that ran out at other weddings, but Jesus wasn't at that wedding. I'm here to tell you that Jesus is at all our weddings. Jesus is at all our, our, he's at the place wherever we need him. He's a present help. I want you to say that he's a present help in the time of need. In the time of need. Jesus makes a statement saying, how can my disciples fast when the bridegroom is with them? How can we be in a place of mourning, in a place of want, when the bridegroom is with us? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to move we're gonna move this morning. There's a couple places I want to hit. I told you guys last week, and I always say the great thing about a series is you can stop it and pick it up next week. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I want us to go down towards the end of the chapter. I'm not sure of the verse. We'll look at verse 12. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. And we are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face, so that the sons of Israel would not stare at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Watch this. But we all, with unveiled faces, looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord. Just as from the Lord, the Spirit, we're transformed into that same image. See, one of the great things about being in this covenant with God, being in this covenant of God, is when we look at God, when we see all the glory, when we're exposed to, to all that he is, it's not something that we just look to admire. But what actually happens is we're looking at a transformation that God is also trying to do in us. See, what God shows us and what Jesus is showing us is, look, the way that I move with my father is the same way that you can move. It's the same way that you can expect for him to show up. It's the same way that you can expect for him to, to move on your behalf. When Jesus stepped into the earth, he didn't come here just to save us uh, and, and, and get us a, an escape from hell or punishment, but he actually came to restore Restore the image, to restore the understanding of this is how we move as sons of God. I'm not going to fear because my father is right here. I'm not going to worry because my father is right here. What, we don't got this? My father is right here. It's according to his riches and glory. I want to go over to, to, to John chapter 6 and look at a story. See, they were at a place in John 2 that, that, that there was no wine 
There was no wine. And Jesus decides to make this his first miracle. And we talked about this early in our series. We said, look, Jesus made something out of nothing because the chemicals and, and the properties that are actually uh, needed to actually put wine together were not present in the H2O. It's not present in the water. You needed, you needed some different uh, chemicals to come together, elements to come together to make it. He made something out of nothing. He made something out of nothing. See, that was the first thing that he showed us that he had the capabilities to do. But in this story, we're about to see because none of us can truly say that we're without nothing. You may not have what you want to have, but you always have something. You always have enough of, of when it's placed in the hands of Jesus. And what, what Jesus is showing is not only am I coming to keep the party going as we talked about last week, but I'm coming to show you the endless supply. See, it may look like you don't have it, but does my father have it? Does heaven have it? Do we have what you need? Does the kingdom have it? That is the question. Let's look at verse one. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd was following him because they were watching the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. But Jesus went up on the mountain there and he sat with the disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. So Jesus, after raising his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? But he was saying this only to test them, for he himself knew what he intended to do. I want to stop right there for just a second. He himself knew what he intended to do. He asked Philip a question. Where do we get enough bread to feed these people? How we respond to that answer really shows if we have shifted our perspective and our understanding concerning our sonship, concerning our, our relationship with God and, and his heart and his mind toward us. See, as we continue this, you're going to see that they turn to they turn to uh, to a way or a method that was not the method of a son. It was the method of one that 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 was without. But watch this. They turn to a natural method. Watch this. Let's look at it. He says he said this to only test them because he already knew what he intended to do. Philip answer said 200 denarii worth of bread is not enough. For them, for each to receive just a little. And one of the other disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? I want you to pause right here and I want to talk about this. Look, he says to them, First, where are we to buy bread? Where are we to buy bread? <laughs> it almost seems like Jesus set them up here. He set them up and the scripture reveals that he set it to test them because the question, right, the question that, that he posed to him, them was not, was not leading them to the answer that, that he really wanted. Now, purchasing of bread, right, the, the funds, the, the amount of money that they had, the resources that they personally had was not the answer or the solution for this moment. Right. They they essentially that he, he pointed them in the wrong direction. And what he was looking for them was to turn back to the right direction. He was trying to show them that 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 way of thinking is not going to lead you to the place that you want to be. I can remember uh, many times where, where where I had been in certain situations and and, and my thoughts and my mind and, and my way of thinking outside of coming into what the kingdom would do in the kingdom way, it would lead me into places that, that, that never yielded fruit. I was talking to a friend the other day uh, as I was, as I was uh, getting my hair cut, and, and we were just talking about decisions we made, decisions we made that, that, that continued to lead us in, 
We're like, we thought it was a great idea, but all we had to do was turn to the God idea. See, God had been directing us and moving us into a, a, a different direction, but yet we hadn't yielded to that instruction. And what we saw is the path that we chose led us into some mess, led us into some situations that we wish we could have just avoided. How could we avoid it? We answer the question the correct way. See, Jesus was looking for them to answer the question the correct way. See, Simon looks at the limitation of the resources available. First, Philip is like, we don't have enough money, right? We, all of the money in the world would not be able to be able to feed all these people, basically. And then, and then Philip says, or, or Simon says, look, there's a boy here, but that's not enough. Remember, in our story with the wine, Jesus is able to take nothing and turn it into something. So whatever the spectrum of trouble or problem that you're in, Jesus is able to handle it. See, I love how he came out from the jump with, with, with a miracle that essentially is, 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 is showing you that he doesn't need a lot. Now they're at the place and Philip or Simon is asking the same question and looking at it and saying, there's only two fishes and five loaves. I don't know what, what, what limited resources you may see in the natural is happening in your life. I know that, 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 that especially in the field that me and Yvonne are in, we're in basically a, a field that only pays what you go out to, to get, right? It, 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 it's not a continuous, not like we know we're going to get paid on the, on the 1st and the, the, the 14th or the 15th. Or it, we, it's not this regularly scheduled program. So it constantly puts us in a place where we are, we can see what we have, but we always see that it's not enough. It's not enough. And what God keeps reminding me and Yvonne is that it's always been enough. There's always enough if it's put into the right hands. What? Because God is able to take that which we have and bring to him. That's the power. That's one of the things that, that I love about giving because what we do when we give, we take from what we have right that 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 little that we have that not enough that we have and we give it out and what happens when you give out from what you have when well, you have less than even what you had if i have a hundred dollars and i give you 50 of it i only now have 50 but what is that now doing that is still that's that's keeping me in this place of understanding that god in order for this to come forth it's something that you have to multiply I'm, I'm, I'm trusting you. That's why I love, I love to continue to give because it's always this place where, God, I'm not going to hold on to everything thinking that I can do it, but I'm going to put it into your hands and allow for you to multiply. I'm going to trust you that as I give to this need or I give to this ministry cause or I give to this individual that, that it's not going to be on me to bring this forth. It's going to be on you to bring this forth. So Simon asked the question, he says, look, there's a boy, but that's only two fishes. Look, he only brought lunch for himself. He's not going to be able to feed all of us. Now watch this. Verse 9, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fishes, but what are these for so many people? Jesus said, have the people recline to eat. I want you to catch this. Have the people recline to eat. That, that, that's essentially Jesus saying, tell them to kick their feet up. Tell them to kick their feet up. See, what, what, what moves us into the place that, that, that God has for us is a shifting into rest. See, remember the children of Israel as they were in Egypt. They were in a place where they actually, they, they were in slavery, but they at least understood how their day was going to work. They understood that if, if, if they did this, they get this. And they had a, they had a particular, uh, it was bondage, but it was, it was more comfortable than, than the wilderness. It was more comfortable for them than the journey that God wanted to take them to. But where was he trying to take them to? He was trying to take them to a place of rest, a place that was flowing with milk and honey, a place of abundance. But notice, in order to get there, you have to 
rest. See, when they tried to hold on to their old mindsets, their own ways, their, their, their ways of thinking, their fears, their concerns, their worries, it kept them from, from, from operating in that faith, in that place of rest that they needed to. And see, Jesus said, look, here we, here's what I need you to do. Tell them to recline because it's time to eat. And what does he do here? He gives thanks. Let's look at it. There was plenty of grass in the place, so the men reclined, about 5,000 of them in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and after giving thanks, what did he do? He distributed them to those who were reclining. He distributed to those who were reclining, those that had got into a position of rest. Hey, take a seat. Sit down. I want you to know that, that all that God really wants us to do is to get into a place of reclining, get into a place of rest, get into a place where we say, God, look, all right, my shift is over. <laughs> it's your turn. I'm going to allow for you to take it from here. I'm going to allow for you to take it from here. See, last week we talked about God with us. But see, God being with us produces so much. We talked about it, liberty. In, in, his, in, his, in his presence, there's fullness of joy. There's, there's, there's so much there in his presence. And what does it allow for us to do? It allows for us to sit back and to rest. See, today, tomorrow, the next day, all God wants us to do is to rest. Because he has it. He has it. Me and Yvonne, we were talking this week, and, and, and as a, a, a situation presented itself, we began to think about different things, and we got to do this, and we do this, and, and I love, I call it the snapback. Our snapback is getting a lot faster to where we're able to, to get to the place, you know what, God, we've been here before, we learned our lesson, we're just going to rest. We're just going to rest. I love how God isn't requiring for us to, to constantly do this perfectly. No, he's always right there. He said, okay, I know you was tripping for a second, but I love you, I forgive you. You're, 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 you're welcome to get right back into that place of rest. I know you were worrying. I know you were, or your focus was off. I know you started to shift and put it on yourself, but there's now no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. I want you to tell you that whenever you're ready to kick your feet up, God is right there ready. See, he wants to keep the party going. He wants to make sure that, that our joy is full. He wants to make sure that, 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 that we have all that we need. See, I love this story, and we'll, we'll talk about some things later on, and this will not be the last of this New Wine series, but I love this story because this story becomes a significant uh, turning point in the disciples' lives. We'll talk about this next week. I want you to rest this week. Recline with Jesus. Hey, say, guys, look, good morning. I'm kicking my feet off. I'm kicking my shoes off today. Good morning. I'm, kick, I'm kicking my feet up. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> you tell me what you got for me. You tell me what, what you want me to do. But I'm going to rest. I'm going to chill. I'm going to relax. Because you got this under control. Your supply is limited. Your supply is limited. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness, for your love. Thank you again for being with us this Sunday. Ah, uh, man, you just continue to pour out in it and to, to give us more and more and more of your goodness and your faithfulness and your love. I just thank you that we can rest in you and continue to just, uh, just, just show us more of your goodness. You're trying to transform us into that same image from glory to glory. I thank you that we're seated together in heavenly places right next to you. I thank you that we're heirs of God, joint heirs with you, that we have all of heaven's access. We have everything that heaven has. I, we receive it, the peace, the joy, the safety, the protection, the love. We receive it this morning, and we just give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.